Well, as you can tell, uh, it's going to be a little unconventional here. Uh, our dress is a little unconventional. Uh, I, I'm going to just take away the curiosity that you may have. What, what's that say on his shirt? Um, it says, Every Day Matters. It's our tagline. And I was just uh, sitting with the Lord uh, the other day, and uh, I thought, okay, let's just make sure everybody understands that uh, we're going to take advantage of every moment of every hour, of every day that God gives us to be together. And uh, every day matters to every one of us. And uh, my family is dressed in, um, oh my, here I am, uh, Grateful Dead shirts. Uh, Cameron was uh, with me for the last three months. And uh, we'd get in the car, and he would hijack my radio. And uh, normally it would be um, uh, the Grateful Dead, but uh, I taught him to love, uh, I thought that I taught him to love uh, one of my uh, guilty pleasures uh, with my George Jones radio through Pandora. And come to find out, uh, he knew every word of every song that came on across, and I just looked at him and I thought, who are you? And so we uh, learned to appreciate one another's uh, music, and uh, he taught me uh, everything about Grateful Dead. I, I thought, how do you know all of this stuff? And so the music today is going to be really non-traditional. I believe it'll bless you. I believe it'll encourage you. I believe it'll honor the Lord. I, I, I believe more than anything, it will expose the life of my my dear firstborn grandson that I loved uh, more deeply than any of you could ever, ever imagine. And so uh, we, we come today to honor Michael Cameron Whitson's life. And uh, so let me just say a word of gratitude and thanks uh, to the hundreds and thousands, actually thousands of uh, messages, phone calls, emails that have come to our family has been phenomenal. And uh, I cannot thank you enough. Uh, thanks to the staff who have rallied uh, around us unbelievably. Uh, thank you to all you pastors that I know that are here. I see, I've see. i seen many of you already and heard uh, of your presence, and, and I appreciate it more than you could ever imagine. Uh, thanks to all of you um, friends of Cameron. Some have flown in here from uh, Arizona to be here in this service. And uh, thanks to all of you who are watching through live stream all over the country and yay, really all over the world. And um, to honor um, the life of this young man that we loved with all of our heart, who uh, fought so desperately, who yearned so intently uh, for life to be normal. And uh, thank God we know where he is. So I want you to understand something as we go into this uh, worship service. Uh, my grandson may have died from an accidental overdose uh, but my grandson had a strong, strong relationship with Jesus, uh, a little bit different than maybe you and I could uh, fathom and understand. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But uh, our family is not grieving as others which have no hope. Uh, because we knew he knew the Lord Jesus as his Savior and as his Lord. And because of the promise of God, not because... That his good outweighed his bad because that's not true. Uh, nor did his bad outweigh the good. I'm just saying it was not by works that we have the assurance that he's in heaven. We have the assurance that he's in glory because of the amazing promises of God. And so we are hopeful one of these days that the trumpet of God is going to sound and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up and I like that next word, together. There's a reunion day coming. Well, I didn't mean to preach here. 
Uh, but I, I just wanted to say thank you. I, I cannot uh, express to you how grateful to God that we are, that we have such a family of God that rallies around us uh, as we face these unbelievable days. Uh, let's go to God in prayer, and then we will uh, get right into the music. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for these folks that have turned aside to come and to share in our grief and our sorrow as your word has taught us. And Father, we pray that if there is one person here uh, that does not know you as Lord and Savior, have never experienced what it means to be forgiven of their sin and have the assurance that when their death day comes, that they would go to heaven. Uh, they have never experienced the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. May today be the day, the homegoing celebration of the life of my grandson. May today be the day that they receive you into their heart and into their life. We ask all of this now in your name. kind of like cruel and unusual punishment to have your preacher daddy tell you to say a few words at your son's funeral but if I'll try to hold it together my wife gave me some good advice so I'm going to go with that um, I've been asked to say a few things about Cameron and his character and personality and I really don't have anything written down so this might go on for a while I hope you guys didn't have any lunch plans uh, no I'm going to make it quick uh, Cameron Whitson was my my firstborn son, and uh, just we we were talking about this. You know, how do you how do you describe Cameron? And maybe tell some people things they might not have known about him. And my wife said, "Well, he was fearless. Like that is the truth. That boy, you had to talk to him about safety because he would go head first into everything. Uh, so yeah, fearless was uh, one of his characteristics by far." Uh, he was doing backflips on the trampoline uh, when he was five years old. I bought him a motorcycle once, and he and his brother and I went riding up in the Uari Forest. And he took off, and I didn't see him till the end of the day. He was gone. And even though my motorcycle was twice as big as his, twice as fast as his, I couldn't catch up with him. He was out there, fearless. Um, Cameron was also adventurous. Uh, when, when we moved to Arizona, well, even behind the house we had here in Indian Trail, uh, always exploring the creek and making rope swings and things to go across the creek and catching bugs and bringing them home. But uh, yeah, just a, he had an adventurous spirit. But when we went to Arizona, he, uh, he tapped into that. He made some really good friends who uh, took him out. And the first week we were there, he almost stepped on a rattlesnake. Uh, so he was, like I said, he was fearless and maybe because he was colorblind, he didn't see the snake. I don't know. What do you think, honey? Uh, but that adventurous spirit went on to, uh, take him hiking and camping, uh, four wheeling off road and motorcycling. And he'd love to just grab the kayaks and throw them in the back of his truck and go out to the lake. And I, and he'd be gone for two or three days with his buddies. And, uh, at one time he and his girlfriend, Decided they'd go camping up in Flagstaff. And they pitched a tent and everything. And next thing you know, they were caught in a snowstorm with rain, hail, and sleet just coming down. They abandoned the camp and ran. Uh, but it was Cameron's adventurous spirit that uh, got him to the top of that mountain in that tent on that snowy day. And um, he was also very competitive. I mean, those of you who played sports with him, I'm sure some of you are here today. He'd try to take your head off if, if you were wrestle with him on the wrestling team. He'd just try to hurt you. And I think that's because he had asthma. Uh, and he, 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 he knew if he didn't pin you in the first 30 seconds, it was probably going to be over. Uh, but uh, very competitive. Compassionate, too, I would say. Um, he always befriended to a fault uh, the, the, the outcasts of society. And uh, could, he honestly couldn't see any harm in uh, some of the folks that I knew him to know. And he said, well, Daddy, you know, I, I see the best in that person. 
And, uh, you know, so it was, a, it was compassionate to a fault. He, he loved his mama. He was a mama's boy, and I want you to know. If it was a choice between daddy or mama, it wouldn't be a choice at all. But uh, compassionate, caring, competitive. And, and I would say uh, Christian this would be a good one. I'm going to leave it at the end. I'm going to leave that rest up to daddy. But, you know, toward the end of his life, he uh, making, making wrongs right and praying with people and for that. I'm very grateful. I do want to say one thing that I was coming in here and thinking it was really important to say. So before I go, turn it over to you, Dad. Who knows what you're going to say? (coughs) But um, uh, my son's rebellious spirit was really something to be admired. And I want to thank uh, Cameron for being the reason that God's people are in this house today. A lot of ways, uh, my time for now got here way too quick. And then in other ways, I didn't think it would ever uh, get here. Um, Passage that I'd like to choose today is found in 2 Corinthians. And it goes like this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all compassion. And the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others uh, with the same comfort that we've received from God. Um, Those of you that have come by the house or called or sent notes that that you've lost a grandchild and uh, loved on my family who have lost a son. Um, it has meant more to us than you could ever possibly imagine. And um, as best as I could remember, I tried to say thank you for be o- being obedient to the Lord because that's exactly what God's intention was, is that God allowed us to go through these things so that somewhere along the way we could minister to others. Frankly, I'm not there yet. Uh, I'll get there by the grace of God. I I will. Right now, I don't know that I could minister to anybody, uh, but uh, one day I will, and I will follow the scriptures and do exactly what God has led me to do, and I pray it will make me a better pastor along the way. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we're distressed, it's for your salvation, and if we're comforted it's for your comfort our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you've shared in our suffering so also you will share in our comfort we don't want you to be uninformed brothers and sisters about the hardships that we've suffered we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure So that we despaired even of life itself. Indeed our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. I can tell you, I understand what that means. But this happened (laughs) that we might not rely on ourselves but to rely on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us. And we've set our hope on him that he will continue to deliver us. Praise his name. As you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks to God for the gracious favor granted to us in answer to your uh, many prayers. Forever etched in my mind will be March the 27th, 1999, when I stood in a birthing room in a hospital in Charlotte with a camera in my hands and recorded the birth of my firstborn grandchild. And life at that moment changed for me and my family forever and forever. Two years later, 
your pastor um, just about was incarcerated for murder when my son and my daughter-in-law decided to move out of the country and take my two-year-old grandson with them. Costa Rica seemed like millions of miles away. I thought as I stood in the shower that morning getting ready to take them to the airport that I would literally die. I felt like an elephant uh, was on my chest. But we made it through. And we rejoiced and loved them in their obedience to the Lord. But I'm going to tell you, I've never been more proud when they came back home. And by then there were two, two young boys, eventually joined by a third young girl with Casey and Kaylee. And they enrolled, Rick let them into Metrolina Christian Academy, uh, knowing the challenges that it would be to have the grandchildren of the senior pastor in his care for those years that he was here. And uh, their sports was something that uh, I thoroughly enjoyed and embraced. And I'll never forget, as long as I live sitting in the stands, I had told Coach Parker, I said, Coach, you... You, you, you would do well if you put Cameron at running back and just try him out because he's a good athlete and he's pretty quick. And uh, Coach Parker likes job security, so <laughs> he put him at running back. And I don't think he ever regretted it. He, it took him about half the season to do it. And uh, he put him in at running back in the first game. Uh, he had 179 yards rushing, two touchdowns, and scored 14 points. And uh, I just looked at Coach Parker and said, I told you so. (laughs) And then I wanted to kill my son again. Six years ago, when he and Bethany informed me that uh, they were going to Phoenix, Arizona, and took my grandchildren, uh, 27, 2800 miles away from my house. Cameron was struggling with an enemy for the last six years that sought to enslave him and to ultimately destroy his life. Last year, through a series of bad choices, it really appeared that all hope had been lost. After multiple overdoses, one being, uh, two actually, being in a two-day span in February around Valentine's Day that took three uh, three doses of Narcan to get him back, he finally realized that he had a problem. And uh, we brought him to North Carolina. And he went through a 28-day rehab program after being detoxed in Phoenix and a 28-day program in uh, Brunswick County called uh, Beach House Recovery. When I went to pick him up, I thought, who in the world are you? He had gained about 40 pounds, looked amazing, about ate me out of house and home for the next several weeks. And our desire was to give him back the hope that he had lost and that we had yearned for. Um, Last week, we uh, took him to... uh, the home going of his cousin. A little bit selfish, Troy, to be honest with you. Just a little bit selfish. We thought, Cameron, if you can just see the pain that this family is going through. We didn't tell him this, but we just thought, Cameron, if you can just see the pain and the hurt and the suffering that this family is enduring right now, maybe it would 
give you the impetus to change and to keep going forward and be that young man that God wants you to be and realize the full potential of your life. While we were there, he just kind of loved on people and was gracious and good and kind and loving. He was broken. He struggled deeply. We left the funeral and uh, went through western North Carolina over into the eastern part of Tennessee through Johnson City and Elizabethton and the backside we came up to Boone. This is Saturday night. We stayed in a log cabin on the side of the mountain. We woke up Sunday morning and the services were on and we listened and became part of the worship service here and after that, we, uh, we're we getting ready to leave. He, he said, I want, I'm ready to go home. I want to go home. And Kathy said, uh, why don't you go to Walmart and get you a fishing pole and let's see if we can catch any fish in this pond. Now, mind you, I hate fishing. Maurice is here and he'll tell you why I hate fishing. I have killed more of his fishing holes I could put a hook in the Atlantic Ocean and there'll never be another fish caught in that water. I've, I've just, I, I've never been any good at it. And uh, yet, I thought, here's an opportunity. So we went to Walmart and got the fishing pole. And uh, he, he wanted me to fish with him. Uh, the first cast I had, I hung it up in a tree and uh, spent the rest of the afternoon getting that out of that tree. But he lined up another lure and uh, I've got a lot of videos and pictures for the next several hours how he cast and he would catch and he would cast and he would catch and cast and he would catch. He caught more fish in an hour than my son has in a whole day in his fishing experience. He inherited some of that stuff from me. May I tell you that it was probably one of the top three days of my life. I will never forget it. The expression on his face, the joy every time he would reel one in. He got real frustrated with Grammy one time. Grammy, did you get that picture? Did you get that? I'm going to send that to Daddy. Grammy, take the picture. It's a great day. The glimmer of hope began to swell and grow. Five days later, my grandson is dead. I want to leave you with three things. Number one, life is so bewildering. Some time ago, God gave me a passage of scripture in Isaiah 59, 21. And he said to me, Mike, the words that I have put in you, I have put in your children and your children's children forever. I took that to mean God was going to heal my grandson. I took it to mean that he was going to experience life in all of its fullness. When I got that call at four o'clock on Thursday, I've never felt so far away from God. Never felt so alienated, so distant. And life at that moment had more bewilderment for me probably than it ever has before in my life. Life didn't make any sense. Have you ever been there? God, this doesn't make any sense. I got your word here. I've read the promises. I receive those promises. I claim those promises. God, my grandson's dead. What, what's going on, God? My wife and I had the, as I look back now, I had the privilege, blessing of a four-hour trip home. 
You, you do know that life doesn't make sense, don't you? Why is it that good, why is it that bad flourishes and good suffers? Why, why is it that cancer takes the life of our friends? Why is it that we lose our jobs? Why is it that kids go astray? Life doesn't make sense. By the way, can I say to you today, it's okay to ask why. You are aware of that, okay? It's okay to ask why. Somebody was telling me in the last couple of days they're reading the book of Job. And uh, I, I said, you, you, you're, you're getting aware that Job wasn't a very patient man, aren't you? And he demanded an audience with God and he wanted to know why am I going through. As a matter of fact, Jesus on the cross my God, my God, why? It's okay to ask why. But here's the deal. The test of our faith comes when we really don't get the answer. The fact of the matter is, even if we knew the explanations, even if we knew the reasons, even if we could somehow uh, come to grips with uh, the totality of the experience as to why things happen, it, it would not help the pain one iota. My wife of 50 years is sitting right here in front of me, and if God came to me and told me and gave me every explanation and said she's going to die and my wife were to die, even knowing the why and the reasons would not eliminate that pain at all. But I can tell you, I still know and believe and experience that God says, Mike, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And I know that last Thursday night, God says, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't want you to be afraid because I will be with you. Last Thursday night, my Savior was right by the side of my grandson. Just as he is with us now, his promise to never leave and never to forsake. I don't know how many of you came by and looked into the casket a little while ago and you saw on his left arm a tattoo of a wolf. I hated that tattoo. I got so frustrated at him when I found out how much he spent on that tattoo and, and, and knowing that he didn't have that kind of money to spend on that tattoo and a waste of time and money and energy and I thought, how stupid. I really, we talked about it. I don't hate it anymore. Because the scriptures have taught me that I'm engraved in the palm of God's hand. Life is bewildering, but I can still have peace in knowing that God has not left me nor forsaken me and he is with us right now. Second thing is that life is broken. Not only is life bewildering, life is broken. Everything about life is broken. Sin and evil broke this world of ours. Nothing perfect about it. The weather's broken, the economy's broken, your body is broken. There are broken relationships, our brain is, you name it, it's a broken world. Cameron believed that his brain was broken. We tried to convince him that he was as normal as the rest of us and that the fact of the matter is we're all broken. Can I get a witness? Isaiah 24 says the earth suffers. Everything's broken. 
for the sins of its people, for they have twisted the instructions of God, violated his laws, and broken his covenant. Therefore, the earth has broken down and has utterly collapsed. Everything is lost. In fact, we're all lost spiritually. Everything is abandoned and confused. But here's the deal. Uh, Life is bewildering. I can still have peace because of the presence of God. Life may be broken, but I can still have the joy of the Lord in my heart and in my life. One of the passages that jumps out at me during this whole process is, and I've preached it hundreds, maybe thousand times, I don't know, but Romans 8, 28 says, and and by the way, it's the most misunderstood, misquoted passage of Scripture, I believe, in all of the Bible. The Bible tells us that all things work together for good. A lot of people just stop right there. That passage is not for everybody. It's not for everybody. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to the purposes of God on their life. May I say to you, it doesn't say all things are good. And I'm just going to declare before God and before man today, this is not a good thing. I've never seen this as a good thing. I hate it. I despise it. It has crushed me. It's crushed our family. It's not a good thing. But I can have joy today because God says I will take this because of those of you who love me, those who are mine. By the way, let me just tell you, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, don't quote that scripture because it's not for you. But God has promised I will take this bad thing and I will blend it in with some other things and I will bring good from it. I can already tell you God is already up to that. I was in the grocery store yesterday. I just had to get out of the house. Somebody else could have done it. I didn't want them to. I just had to get out of the house. And I went to the grocery store and for the third time in a couple of days, somebody stopped me in the in the aisle, and they said to me, I, 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 I got to tell you, I got to tell you that I know you're hurting, but because of this, it has prompted me to have a conversation with my kids about the danger of drugs. I, I've heard this over and over, that God is already using our pain, our suffering, our loss, to open up channels of communication with families everywhere to try their best to stop what evil is trying to do. Last Thursday night, when Cameron died, Satan thought that he had won. I made this statement in a sermon last week or week before, I don't remember when, Understand something, the devil can't hurt God. The devil can't get to God. If you want to hurt parents, what do you do? You go after their children. Satan can't get to God, but he can, does have access to us. I suspect that when Cameron breathed his last breath, that Satan thought, oh, what a victory. What a victory. But I'm going to tell you, Satan lost big time. Because my grandson is no longer under the mental and the emotional torture that Satan has been inflicting on him, and no longer can he touch him My grandson is in glory, free from pain, free from temptation, and free from addiction. Hallelujah to Jesus. Life is bewildering, but we can still have peace. Life is broken, but we can still have joy. Life is a battle.
my son, my daughter-in-law, my grandson Casey and my granddaughter Kaylee in the last five years have suffered unbelievable pain. They've gone through everything that you could imagine. But they did everything humanly possible to help Cameron have the victory and be delivered. But this insatiable thirst for a higher experience drove Cameron to multiple overdoses. So in the end of February, we moved him to North Carolina. He went to the Beach House Recovery in Brunswick County, as I said, and um, God began to use him in some remarkable ways to touch lives that we're still hearing about even now. Um, I got a call from one of the men at Beach House Recovery, and he said, you don't know me, but uh, I just want you to know in the darkest time of my life, when my fiance died of cancer, that drove me to drugs. Cameron Whitson was the only one who understood enough to help me through that crisis. And he went on to tell me how that he ministered to him. But as many of you know, Kevin and I and our family realized that we were in a fight that we could not win without help. Our pride disintegrated and we enlisted the prayers of hundreds and thousands of people on behalf of Cameron. You went to the mat for us. I cling, I cling to the scriptures, cling to God's promises. Countless sleepless nights Kathy and I spent. And through the day we would grab hold of a little ray of hope like we did this past Sunday. There was just a, a little ray of hope. He's going to make it. Some of you would call me and say, how's Cameron? And I would say, man, I believe he's turned the corner. I, I believe he's got it made. I believe he's got this thing whipped. A day or so later, Something would happen and that hope would be snatched away all over again. And then on May the 21st, about 4 o'clock, all hope seemed to be gone. Let me ask you, children of God, something. What do you do when what you were expecting and what you placed your faith in that was going to happen. And it doesn't come about. What do you do? Kathy and I were uh, <laughs> watching this stupid little mini-series on television. And it, it, it's very intense. And, and the hero in there is an amazing person. And, and I was watching it one night, and it looked as if the hero uh, was dead. It just looked like there was no hope that he would ever survive. He was gone. And all of a sudden, the thought hit me, hey, stupid, there are three more seasons of this thing. So when what you were expecting doesn't materialize, keep in mind I've read the last chapter of the book. I see where this goes. God has promised. We're in a battle for sure, but we know how it ends. Life is bewildering, but we can still have peace. Life is broken, but we can still have joy. Life is a battle, but we can still have hope. And we do. We do. Our hope is in the resurrection. 
Our hope is the resurrection. Our hope is in Jesus. On three different occasions, and I'm going to close. I'm, I know I'm probably a little longer than I ever intended to be, but on three different occasions, um, I've sat across from Cameron because of his struggle with addictions. Um, I sat across from him and, and I said to him, Cameron, um, I, I want to hear about your salvation experience. And he said, well, Pop, uh, the, my, my first recollection was when I was about 10 years old and my dad prayed with me and I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sin and to come into my heart and I received him as my Lord and Savior. And, and he said, Papa, somewhere in my teenage years, he said, I don't really remember exactly how old I was at that moment. Uh, I wanted to make sure, I wanted to know. And I gained the assurance of my salvation as a teenage boy. Um, when we were discussing Beach House Recovery, he was going into a unknown environment. And we were talking about the philosophy of their treatment. And he said, now, Pop, I got something to tell you. I said, what is it, Cameron? He said, now, listen, if they get to that point where they want to talk to me about a hole in my heart, I will probably get up and leave. I said, what do you mean by that, Cameron? He said, I don't have a hole in my heart. I know that Jesus lives in my heart. I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. I, I, don't, I don't want them to talk to me about that hole in my heart. I, I want them to help me figure out why I do what I do. He was very comfortable with his salvation experience. Are you? Cameron could go back to a time and a place when he was 10 years old and when he was a teenage boy and he could tell you explicitly what happened at that point his life before that his life after that he knew Jesus do you know him do you have the assurance that when your death's day comes, and it's going to come, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. You are, if you live long enough, are going to die. Will there be some pastor be able to comfort your family with the knowledge of your assurance that Jesus Christ lives his life in you and through you? Can you remember where you were when you turned away from sin and you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and he saved your soul? Do you remember where you were? You may not remember the day or the date, but you ought to remember where you were. If you've never had a place, then you need one and it could be right here and it could be right now. And I can assure you Loving Cameron Whitson for 21 years, I know that he would want every one of you to have that assurance. I wonder if we wouldn't bow our heads now and let's close our eyes for just a minute. How many of you would be willing right now to turn away from sin and place your faith in Jesus? You say, Pastor, I, I want to do that. I just don't know how. Well, the first thing is that you admit that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Admit that your sins have separated you from God. Be willing to turn away from that. Would you pray something like this with me right where you're seated? Would you just pray, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on a cross for my sin. Just say that in your heart of hearts. Really mean it. I believe that you rose from the dead on that third day. I know that I'm a sinner. And my sin has separated me from you. Please forgive me of my sin. 
today I willingly turn away from sin. And with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Every head bowed and every eye closed for just a minute. I give you my word. I'll not embarrass you. I'll not come back to where you are. I won't call attention to you in any way. But if you prayed that prayer with me just then as I prayed it, and you really meant it with all of your heart, I want you to lift your eyes, and I want you to look right into my face. And by looking at me, you're saying, Pastor, I prayed that prayer with you just now, and I really meant it. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Two people right here on my left and on your right. Would you just, others, would you just lift your eyes, look right this way? How about right here in this section? If you prayed that with me, would you just lift your eyes and look right here? Okay. How about right here in this section? If you prayed that with me, would you just, as these others have over on my left, would you just look right this way as well? on my right and your left just lift your eyes look right in here just look right at me just look right at me okay God bless thank you anybody else anybody else I see you in the back thanks guys thank you thank you thank you several right back there thank you thank you God bless you. I see you right there. Thank you. Would everyone please stand for just a second? 